Welcome to another Level Up. And in this one, we're going to be looking at something that seems quite subtle, but is one of those things that can make all the difference to your playing. What we're going to be talking about are chord voicings, and most importantly, voice leading. Now those sound like complicated terms, but when we talk about a chord voicing, we simply mean how we've put the notes together in that chord to make that particular version of that chord. I'll give you an example. This is a voicing of a C chord. It has the three notes, C, E and G, that make up a C chord. But so does this one. Now you could also call these chord inversions. They're not quite the same thing because chord inversions tend to be based upon taking the lowest note and adding it to the top and making that the highest note and keep on moving the lowest note to the top and you get your root position, your first inversion, your second inversion. Whereas chord voicings could be, for example, in that C chord, I have a G, a C, an E, and another C. And in this one I have a G, another G, an octave higher. You know, it's not necessarily just the inversion, it's what collection of notes have we got and how have we put them together. But that aside, the most important thing when we talk about chord voicings is how one chord gets to another chord. And that's where we talk about voice leading. Why are we calling these voicings? Why the use of the word voice? Well, this comes from choirs. This comes from groups of people singing together. If you imagine, I've got four different people here, one for each string. They all can sing one note and they all have a range. Some of them can sing lower than others, some of them can go higher. So when you've got, say, your four people or four groups of people that form a choir, what you're going to be doing is having them all singing different notes at the same time to form the harmony. And the harmony they form is just like the chords that we form. You have to be very careful with your choir not to ask somebody that's just sung a very low note to then leap to a very high note and the person next to them who's just sung a very high note to leap down to a very low note. The reason is that one, you'll make it very difficult for the people in the choir to sing that just as that would be quite difficult for us as a player to play that. But also it wouldn't sound smooth. It would sound like everyone was leaping around from one place to another rather than creating this nice smooth flowing harmony. And it's something that on the ukulele and on other stringed instruments like the guitar for example, we often don't think about. There's a reason we don't think about it and that's because the instrument begins by helping us out and almost doing it for us. Let me give you some examples. If I play the chords of C, F and G7 in their open positions down here, None of the notes have to move very far, and that's fairly obvious because they're all in the first three frets. If I play a C chord, and then I play an F chord, well, my C string hasn't moved at all. My E string has gone up one fret, my G string has gone up two frets, and this note at the top has gone down three frets. Not very far. Also, some have gone up, some have gone down, and some have been able to stay on the same note, which is kind of like a balancing act. If some go one way, some go the other, and some stay the same, that movement is going to feel balanced and smooth. Now we don't think about that because when we're playing, they're the first chords we learn. We don't start off learning a chord here and then a chord right up here. They come later. And because that's how our instrument works and lots of other instruments work, it's something that often we never consider. But we could have made those three a tiny bit smoother just by adding one note to that F chord. You can play your F chord with two fingers, but you can also add the third fret of the A string and it's still an F chord. But that's the note I was just playing in the C chord. So I could play C, with that note on the top, then an F, keep that note on the top, and then my G7 as before. Let me play both of them and just have a listen. 
The first one with a two finger F. And the second one with three fingers for the F. It's subtle, but now fewer notes have to move to get me from the C to the F. And the one that now doesn't move, this third fret here, that was the one that was moving the furthest of all of them. That was moving from the third fret three steps down to the open string. All the others were moving by one fret or two frets. So that's taken the biggest leap out of that chord and got rid of it and replaced it with a note that doesn't go anywhere. So that's a lovely smooth change. And from that F to the G7, well, my index finger stays the same. The note on the G string goes down two frets. The note on the C string, open, goes up two frets. And the note that I'm holding down there, that top note we had on the C and the F, just goes down one fret. Lovely, smooth changes. As I said though, if the ukulele is kind of doing this for us, why do we have to think about it? Well, let's imagine a chord sequence where one of the chords we can't or don't know how to play down here. Because we always get to that point when we're playing where there's a chord that's very difficult to play or impossible to play in the first few frets. And so we have to go up the neck for it. E is one of those chords. Now, it doesn't really matter how you do this E chord. Some people have different ways, but often we learn an E chord further up the neck. So I'm playing an E chord by barring the 4th fret, and my little finger is on the 7th fret here. Now that's fine. Let's say I'm playing a common chord sequence in the key of E, which would be E, A, F sharp minor, and B7. Now did you notice that one of those chords stood out? The A to the F sharp minor to the B7, beautiful, but then was this right up here. This one has a note right up at the seventh fret and all these at the fourth fret and it leaps to an A where some of those notes have gone down. One's gone down seven frets, one's gone down five frets, one's gone down four frets, one's gone down th what two frets. And they've all gone down. They haven't had some going up and some going down. So that move doesn't sound very smooth at all. Now don't get me wrong, there are times when you'll want to make a move like that. Either for dramatic effect, or because you're playing chord melody. And the important thing is you have the melody note on the top of the chord. So you might need to go and I jumped from right up here to right down there but that's because I was trying to get the right melody note on the top. Most of the time when you're just strumming chords accompanying a song say, you're going to want to make those chord changes as smooth and balanced as you can because otherwise it does sound clunky. Imagine um, it's one of those things, maybe one of your uh, kids or one of your neighbours has taken up the electric guitar. I did this when I first learnt the electric guitar. You learn one chord shape and you slide it around the neck and you end up with this kind of thing. And it's great fun when you first get that and you know it's really exciting. But pretty soon you realise that using one shape and sliding it up and down doesn't sound quite like the records you're listening to. They sound more sophisticated. They don't sound as clumsy. And that's when you start to realise that there are different shapes and different places to play them and you can smooth it out. So let's fix the one in E that we just had. There are two ways we can fix it. We can either take this E and find a way of playing E down here to match up with the other three chords that didn't move around very much. Or we can move the other three up to go with this E. And it's good to be able to do both. So let's do the easier one first. Here's an E chord shape that is often missed out. 
It's a bit of a tricky one, but a lot of people find it easier than going up and barring. Now that E chord moves to this A beautifully because we have notes staying the same. We have notes going down a little bit and we have notes going up a little bit and the whole thing is a nice smooth transition. And from there we can do F sharp minor just by adding one finger and our B7. And even if you did your B7 as a bar, if you know your B7 as a bar chord, that's fine as well. That's still a nice smooth transition. If we do that one, of course, though, that open first string from the F sharp minor hangs over, which is nice. Okay, let's look at a trickier one. We'll now fix the other three to go with this E up here. So if we're playing an E chord barred at the fourth fret with my little finger there on the seventh fret, I could find an A by leaving the bar there and using my second and third fingers to make something that resembles an F chord shape. And that's an A chord. And just like when we had that shape down here for an F, I could have left my little finger where it was on the seventh fret. That's a lovely smooth transition from E to A in exactly the same way that that C to F transition worked. However, my next chord is going to be an F sharp minor. And I can do that F sharp minor if I don't have that little finger there. I can put that little finger down just underneath my ring finger. I'm making really a barred shape of a D minor. So a D minor chord there moved up and barred at the fourth. But I'm not actually going to do the bar because for me on a soprano, that's a bit of a squeeze. So I'm going to just move my index finger across to the first string. But my second and third fingers are in the place they were just in. They're not moving. I'm adding my little finger on the sixth fret of the C string, my index finger on the fourth fret of the first string, and I have an F sharp minor. And as you can see, now I have to make the choice. Do I keep my little finger down from the E to the A and then move that note down to the fourth fret for the F sharp minor? Or do I do that move earlier and take my little finger off when I go to the A and then have that note stay where it is for the F sharp minor? And that's up to you to make that decision. Now I need a B7 and the closest B7 to this one is also at the fourth fret. It's a G7 shape, but I'm playing it without using my index finger, using those three and sliding it up and then also bringing my G string up as well with my index finger until I get to the fourth fret. And I've now got a B7. So if I put those together, I get this nice smooth transition. And then there's the one that we had before down at the bottom end of the neck. Both of those, I think you'll agree, sound better than this at the beginning. So as you are mapping your way through a song and you're working out which chords to play, don't just think, oh, I know how to play that chord in one place, therefore I will just have to go to that one and live with it. Think about how you can make the most of these smooth transitions from one chord to another. Have a look through your songbook and see which songs have that moment where you go, oh, I'm going to have to make a jump and then see if you can get rid of it. I hope you've enjoyed this one and I'll see you again soon. Bye bye.